Hello, and welcome to Pitt Street Research. My name is Stuart Roberts, and I'm one of the co-founders of our firm. And joining me from Melbourne on the afternoon of Friday, the 22nd of December, 2023, is Dr. Nina Webster, who's the CEO of Dimerix, ASX DXB. Nina, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So um, three days before Christmas, Nina, but that's not the reason you've got a smile on your face. Uh, the smile on your face is, I, I, it, it, well, many, many reasons for that, but one of them is you've made a lot of progress in a clinical study that Dimerix is running in FSGS, where we've reached phase three. What in the blazes is FSGS? Yeah, so it's a very, very good question. Um, so FSGS is a disease called focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. And FSGS essentially means some sections of the kidney filtering unit are scarred. Those scarred sections spread across the kidney over time until there's not enough cells to effectively filter the blood. Now, typically, kidney failure occurs within about five years of diagnosis in FSGS, and that patient ultimately requires a dialysis or kidney tra transplant, which, of course, really impacts their quality of life, puts a huge strain on healthcare system and significant costs involved. Now, sadly, for those who receive a transplant, around 60% get reoccurring FSGS in the transplanted kidney, and nobody knows why. It does affect adults and children as young as two years old. And at this time, there are no drugs approved specifically for FSGS anywhere in the world. So treatment options and prognosis are really poor. But for us, DMX200 really has the potential to be the first specifically approved drug for FSGS orphan disease. So um, FSGS is an orphan indication. Uh, I understand it's, it's idiopathic, just, just occurs. It's not like uh, someone's lifestyle uh, choices have led to FSGS. Is that true? Yeah, that, so there's a, a few different types of FSGS, essentially four different types. The first is primary FSGS. Uh, secondary, uh, sorry, the second one is genetic FSGS. So there is where there's a, a specific allele relevant to that FSGS type. Uh, FSGS of unknown cause. And then the fourth one is FSGS, secondary FSGS. Now, that's where it's caused by something completely different, uh, for example, hepatitis or um, AIDS. And in those scenarios, the treatment is you treat the, the cause and then the FSGS will go away. But the first three, there is uh, no, no treatment available for any of those types of FSGS. Right. Um, and as you uh, rightly pointed out before, the um, solutions are hideously expensive. Uh, it costs the best part of half a million dollars in America, at least, to do a kidney transplant, uh, yeah. and and so so uh, uh, that's that's expensive. Um, uh, the the uh, kidney dialysis uh, has gotten more efficient over time, but that's still a pretty expensive part of the healthcare system as well. So it's fair to say that any uh, pharmaceutical based therapies have got to make a strong contribution to the healthcare economics of uh, managing SSGS going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, that was one of the things in, in 20, 2019 in the US, sorry, 2021 in the US, um, kidney disease cost the healthcare system $88 billion. And $55 billion of that was in uh, kidney uh, dialysis treatments. So you can imagine there's a huge impetus in trying to reduce that cost. So drugs like DMX200 could certainly not just decrease that cost, but also really increase the quality of life, given typically the average time on a dialysis per week is at least 12 hours. Right. Now, so uh, let's uh, talk briefly about DMX200, and we'll come back to, to FSGS and your, and your, um, your phase three. So DMX200 is, uh, is an old uh, anti-inflammatory drug called Repogermania. Um, you've got some IP around that, and you've actually done a reformulation, so the patients only need, need to take it uh, twice a day. Um, that's added to uh, the standard of care. And the standard of care isn't great in FSGS. It's just uh, one of the angiotensin receptor blockers that you normally take for blood pressure. Uh, have I understood the, the scenario correctly? Yeah, absolutely. So if you if you put it into context, you look at the three key mechanisms of, of sclerotic kidney disease. The first is that they present with high blood pressure. And as those kidneys work really, really hard under pressure, they become inflamed. That's ongoing. It causes persistent inflammation called sclerosis or scarring. As they become scarred, they die off. Now, cells in the kidney are not like other cells in the body, so they cannot regenerate. And this is why it's progressive. You can imagine as those cells die off, uh, the remaining cells work even harder, causing more pressure, causing more inflammation, causing more cell death. And that far, uh, cycle gets faster and faster until you're in uh, kidney failure. So the current standard of care is that blood pressure medication that you mentioned, or an antihypertensive. It's called an angiotensin receptor blocker, or an ARB. Our drug, Repogermanium, 
is a small molecule. It's an oral capsule and it works on the inflammatory pathway. So it reduces the inflammation and ultimately aims at preventing that scarring. But together, those two treatments create this synergistic benefit for the patient. And this really helps understand the design of our clinical trial where all patients stay on that background therapy of that blood pressure medication, the ARB, throughout the study. Right. Um, it's a relatively small uh, market opportunity, uh, but with a, a big dollar value in the event of success. Talk to us about the prevalence of FSGS in, in key jurisdictions. Yes. Yeah, so um, FSGS affects around 220,000 patients globally. Um, it doesn't ha have a treatment available at the moment. Um, and so FSGS could be the first product to make it to market. Now, in terms of, of the seven major markets, the expectation is that that could be around $3.2 sorry, $3 billion by 2032. And that's not even including China. So it's a really big opportunity, given that in this disease, as you mentioned earlier, this is an orphan disease. That means it's a rare type of disease. We get what's called orphan drug pricing. So when you talk about 220,000 patients, but at that orphan drug pricing, which can be around that $120,000 per patient per year in the US, that means it's a very commercially attractive market. Right. Um, now, the encouraging part of, of uh, Dimerix's drug development program is you've talked to the, uh, the drug regulators in the US and Europe, and they're telling you a single phase three uh, is, is suitable for approval in both jurisdictions with some interesting uh, biomarkers as uh, approvable endpoints. Uh, talk to us first of all about the, the single phase three and then the two endpoints that we'll be doing some interim analysis on. Yeah, absolutely. So the action three phase three study, it's what we call a randomized double blind placebo controlled study. A um, bit of a mouthful, that one. And, and that's in patients with FSGS receiving that background standard of care or the angiotensin receptor blocker. It's a study that is running in 11 different countries at the moment in over 70 clinical sites with the first analysis expected to come out in March 2024. So when we look at that study design, whilst the full study that follows 286 patients across two years, and that measures kidney function, which we also call EGFR, or estimated glomerular filtration rate, it's essentially kidney function. The first analysis, the one in March 2024, is after the first 72 patients reach approximately 35 weeks. That is on protein in the urine. So why protein in the urine or proteinuria? That is because think of a healthy kidney. It's a really good filter. It essentially links together and there are no holes and the protein cannot leak into the blood, well, uh, into the urine, sorry. Over time, when you uh, have kidney disease, that what happens is the cells become quite leaky and you end up with these holes. So the protein spills into the urine. And that is a really good measure of the rate of progression of kidney disease. So you can measure protein and urine as a surrogate endpoint, and also that kidney function as a secondary uh, uh, surrogate endpoint. So that means that these studies, instead of taking decades and looking at end-stage renal failure, can be done in months and years, looking at proteinuria and EGFR. Now, March 2024 is not far away now. We're having this conversation uh, just before Christmas 2023. Um, this is not your approvable endpoint, right? But this this will give you a good indication about how things are going and, and in, encourage us for what comes next, right? That's correct. So that when we see the first 72 patients reach approximately 35 weeks, we look at their proteinuria. That will tell us that we're seeing a good difference between drug and placebo, a clinically and statistically meaningful difference between drug and placebo, and that we're on track with the study. The second interim analysis, that's after the first 144 patients reach 35 weeks, that includes the first 72, so an extra 72. If that data is compelling at that second analysis, we have the potential for going for what's called an accelerated or conditional approval in some territories. And that's where you get early market access for serious conditions that fill a medical, unmet medical need. Much like a, you think of the emergency use approvals during COVID, if successful, the study still has to carry on in the background for the full two years whilst the product is already on market. Right. Now, I've looked at, uh, at uh, the, these endpoints that we're talking about. Uh, they both pre give a pretty good in indication that, um, that the drug is working as planned. So Correct. investors, if they see a good number, and, and in particularly a, a statistically significant number on that first interim analysis three months or so, um, uh, and they've got the stock, then I think you'll be hearing uh, sh uh, champagne uh, corks popping. I suspect you've got a bit in the fridge yourself there, uh, uh, Nina, ahead of the big day. 
Yeah, that's that's certainly what we plan for. Um, and based on the the very encouraging phase two data that we saw, that is what we would expect. Right. Um, what's interesting to me is the speed with which you've, you've been able to recruit. Uh, yeah, but but it, it isn't easy running this clinical trial. Uh, you've pretty much got to open one center for every patient because it's a rare a rare disease. But you've been successful in uh, in getting enough sites to get those first seventy two patients so, so that we're on track. Um, what's been the, the big challenge of running the study? Yeah, so exactly to that point, Stuart, uh, this is a, an orphan disease or rare disease, and it does mean that one of the biggest challenges is finding the patients, and that is why we opened so many sites. So you think just over 70 sites to find 72 patients. Now, we are continuing to recruit in those 72, 72, sorry, 70 sites, and we will continue to recruit as we go through. Once we hit March, we will be opening more sites in more countries, including China, where we got a recent IND approval as well. So we will have to open more sites to find these patients and make sure that we recruit as efficiently and as effectively as possible. And, and let, let's conclude on, on that uh, point about China. I've really been impressed that uh, that the uh, China is going to be part of this, this phase three. Your guidance from the uh, Chinese equivalent of the FDA um, is that uh, they'll accept all of the data that you've got from outside China. Uh, and so long as you've got enough Chinese patients within the current phase three, that's acceptable for approval there. I've never seen that in 20 years of covering life sciences, and I suspect it's fairly rare. Yeah, it's it's something we've, we've been absolutely delighted with is getting the, the IND open in China. And um, China represents a really commercially attractive opportunity, given uh, there's such a large proportion of FSGS patients in China, mainly driven by the population in China being so, so large. Um, the key thing for us here is that most of the time when companies go into China, you have to run what's called um, a bridging study. Uh, it's essentially ensuring that the, the PK in the Chinese population is the same in, in other territories around the world. That has been waived in our case. We can actually recruit in the Action 3 study, open sites effectively from March once we get past our, our first analysis point. Uh, and that means it saved us, of course, a lot of time and, and, and effort in that clinical study and gives us access to the large number of patients in China. What it does mean is we collect that PK during Action 3 instead. And that means, again, very efficient way of getting it approved in China if we uh, recruit sufficient patients in the Action 3 study, as well as FDA and EMA. So one study really did fit all in this case. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, so, uh, so there you have it. Uh, uh, phase three uh, action study, action three study in um, uh, FSGS, uh, and uh, we're getting to the first interim analysis point in March of next year. So, potentially, two thousand and twenty-four could be your year, Nina, and that of your shareholders. Absolutely, I think it's a very exciting time for us. I think it's worth reminding ourselves that we're all invested in a company that's at the forefront of delivering a new treatment for a rare type of kidney disease with no existing treatments available anywhere in the world at the moment. If successful, our drug could make a huge difference to these patients. And that's something that we're, we're very excited about. It's uh, highlighting that compelling nature of the Action 3 study that's ongoing at the moment. And first analysis, really not far away, March 2024. Um, I think in addition to the recent licensing transaction we did, you know, we've got a lot of upside, I think, uh, potential for the company to come. Yes. Nina Webster, well done. Uh, have a great Christmas and we'll talk again in the new year. Thank you very much. Thanks for talking, Stuart. 